now on committee, this is, um, and great minds think alike, I was chatting with Ina. Um, this is really sort of accountable care organization 101, because S7, which is, um, for the most part, the healthcare committee deals with accountable care organizations. Um, there is a bill that came over from the Senate that currently um, sits um, in uh, House Health Care that um, really is, you know, having a study to bring um, human service long-term care perhaps into ACOs, and then there's two other pieces around that have nothing to do with ACOs. Little, little added bows and ribbons that have nothing to do with ACOs. But um, I thought it was important that whether we formally get um, the bill or whether we do the but however it's going to happen, um, that we understand it so we can be thoughtful. Welcome. Thank you. For the record, my name is Ina Beckis. I'm the Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services. So they, are you in the Secretary's office? Correct. Yes. And who else is in the Secretary's office? It's a policy person like you. That's a policy person. Well, because you're the Director of Healthcare Reform, so I, do you know? Sorry, is that an unfair question? <laughs> it's not an unfair question. There's another policy position in the office that's vacant right now, but is being recruited for, and that's an AHS policy position, and it's um, one that Paul Dragon, who you may be familiar with, former, formerly held. I also, um, in the office, work with Auburn Watersong, who I believe you've met in this committee, who's the, director, the director of trauma. Yes, trauma prevention and resilience development. And Auburn reports to me in my position because we think that the link between trauma prevention, resilience development, and healthcare reform is one that we should foster in an agency. Aside from that, uh, policy uh, persons in the in the secretary's office. Um, I'm not sure that there, there's the special uh, assistant to the secretary. Okay, that's, okay, that's the time. <laughs> Thank you. I began in my role in uh, June 2018. And so I think that I have one year before I have to know everything about AHS. <laughs> and, I'm not sure. And I think, <laughs> you know, I, have to. I think that in, it, realistically I should get 10 years <laughs> to know everything about AHS. So as, as uh, you mentioned, um, this presentation is in, intended to help uh, provide context for accountable care organizations and to do some basic overview about what accountable care organizations are and uh, their intent and how they fit into Vermont's healthcare landscape, as well as uh, what they look like nationally. So you have some perspective about accountable care organizations. In order to do that, I'll discuss with you what an accountable care organization is, what an alternative payment model is, because while accountable care organizations are organizations of providers, they also serve to accept alternatives to fee-for-service, and they are a vehicle for changing payment from fee-for-service method to uh, alternative payment methodologies. I want to give you uh, ACOs in the national landscape, a look at, at that, as well as ACOs and alternative payment models in Vermont, what Vermont has uh, experienced with ACOs here in our healthcare landscape from 2013 up until this point today, and then talk to you, if we have time, about the Vermont All Care Model Accountable Care Organization Agreement. You've probably heard some about the All Care Model. The All Care Model its official title is Vermont All Pair Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement. So accountable care organizations are central to the agreement and are the component of health care reform that uh, is, is driving our agreement with the federal government and the expectations therein that Vermont uh, reduce the rate of growth in health care costs and improve health care outcomes in the state. What is an accountable care organization? This is Medicare's definition. Medicare defines accountable care organizations as groups of doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers 
who voluntarily form partnerships to collaborate and share accountability for the quality and cost of care delivered to their patients. The Affordable Care Act made it possible for Medicare to facilitate these sorts of arrangements between providers and to provide through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, as well as through CMS, the full Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, for alternative payment flows to accountable care organizations by Medicare. ACOs. Try that again. <laughs> the Affordable Care Act created a pathway for Medicare to pay a, a, accountable care organizations differently than fee-for-service. From the beginning of Medicare, 1965, Medicare has paid providers for every service that they perform after they perform that service. Accountable care organizations can be paid differently by Medicare in ways where there are targets for their overall spending, and then there's a reconciliation or a true up to that target. And here in Vermont, as I'll describe, <coughs> Medicare is actually paying the accountable care organization upfront a fixed prospective payment prior to the care being delivered to the population for which the group is responsible for. That means that the providers have more flexibility to provide for a range of services that may have not been reimbursed uh, by the traditional fee-for-service model. One is a care coordination service, calling another provider to see if you're a healthcare provider, you may want to make a call to another healthcare provider to make sure that there's a warm handoff with your patient or to seek expertise and otherwise coordinate around care to make the experience of care more seamless and more efficient for the patient, that's not something that has been paid for in a fee-for-service reimbursement model. I have, I have a short video here that I think will help to uh, describe ACOs. I want to preface the video with um, the information that this video is a little bit dated. There are now more advanced alternative payment models in circulation than the video describes. And also this video is talking about a particular type of accountable care organization. The accountable care organization that's operating here in Vermont is one that's broader than just physicians. And we can talk about that more. This video is about physicians. But I think it's very helpful in describing just a new way to get health insurance. It also ushers in a new approach to care. Meet the ACO. An accountable care organization is a network of doctors and hospitals that shares financial and medical responsibility for patients. The goal is to coordinate care and eliminate unnecessary spending. Medicare set these up around the country, and private insurers have too. In the health system today, patients are usually responsible for coordinating their own medical care. Someone with heart disease may see a primary care doctor, a cardiologist, and maybe even a heart surgeon. But the doctors might not talk much, so they could order repetitive tests or prescribe conflicting drugs. That isn't good for the patient, and it's expensive. It's also not the way things work in most other industries. Imagine your car won't start. Now imagine that to fix it, you had to schlep to the transmission whisperer, the battery baron, the timing belt tycoon, and the piston professional. Each would only look at their piece of the car and not think about how the parts work together. That makes no sense. Instead, you go to an auto garage where an organized crew works together to make your car run again. An ACO brings that kind of coordination to your medical care. Your doctors, imaging specialists, surgeons, hospitals all work together and share information to figure out the best way to fix you up and keep you healthy afterwards. What's in it for the ACOs? ACOs that save Medicare money get to keep a portion of that savings. Mm -hmm. If the doctors and hospitals can show they're doing a good job keeping people healthier. So are ACOs working? Well, the jury's still out. It's unclear how much money ACOs save, and some organizations that try to form ACOs have quit. 
there are also concerns that ACOs could reduce competition and lead to higher prices. Wait a minute, how is this different from an HMO? ACOs have been accused of being health maintenance organizations in disguise. Both depend a lot on a primary care doctor who coordinates care. But there are some major differences. Patients in HMOs are covered only when they see doctors that are part of the HMO. In a Medicare ACO, patients can also see doctors outside the ACO. Should we worry that an ACO can save money by cutting corners? ACOs get rated on a list of quality measures to make sure no one skimps on care people need. These measures don't yet track all aspects of care, but the goal is to give ACOs financial incentives to keep people healthy instead of just treating them once they're sick. Want to learn more? Go to the address on the screen. You got Carl dancing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did that quietly. <laughs> Not much. It's a very helpful video. I do think the narrator speaks pretty quickly. I can't talk that fast, but I'm sure that she rehearsed. So as I said, the video talks about an accountable care organization that's chiefly uh, made up of physicians. And here in Vermont, we have uh, one accountable care organization at this time, which has a much broader network than just physicians. The um, network includes hospitals and physicians, but also includes home health providers, uh, provide mental health and substance abuse providers and a broad continuum of care. I think that's important to talk about because a lot of times um, we think about the ACOs working best if they're able to achieve clinical integration and that means integration between uh, different service providers and if we're imagining a, how an integrated system promotes health, well-being, um, and emphasizes prevention, I think that looking at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's framework for an integrated healthcare system is important and helpful in thinking about Vermont's uh, accountable care organization. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says that an integrated healthcare system is one that balances clinical care with prevention-oriented public health and community-based social services to improve health outcomes while driving down costs. And in Vermont's ACO that's currently active, we see this type of continuum of providers participating in the network. And we also see that population-based alternative payment models are in play to allow for flexibility in payment and to allow for there to be a, uh, a different model of payment that, uh, that embraces the clinical care balance with prevention-oriented public health and community-based social services. You can hear from the ACO, perhaps you will, about their investment in population-based health programs and how they partner uh, with community-based social services. But the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says very clearly that the population-based alternative payment model is important for advancing the goals of a clinical uh, and integrated healthcare system in, in order to meet the goal of an integrated healthcare system. Robert Wood Johnson is saying that population-based alternative payments matter because they create, again, that flexibility for this broad continuum of providers to work together. ACOs are the groups of providers that have come together to share accountability for patient care. It's in their title, Accountable Care Organization. But an accountable care organization may not be very effective in sharing this responsibility if it's not being paid for in an alternative way, like you heard in the video. But there isn't just one alternative payment model that accountable care organizations accept. There are, in fact, many alternative payment models. Medicare alone has quite a few different ACO programs that it operates. Then, as you heard from the video, there's also commercial payers that are uh, creating alternative payment models. And I'll also talk to you about Medicaid programs that have alternative payment models. 
So broadly speaking, alternative payment models pay providers for quality and care and improved health instead of reimbursing healthcare providers only after each individual service is performed. In the most advanced alternative payment models, service delivery does not trigger payment and payment is not linked to volume of services. Rather, providers are paid in advance and responsible for the care of a patient for a long period of time, a year. In Vermont, that's happening with Medicare and Medicaid in how it's paying One Care Vermont, the ACO that's here in our state. Tracy? Um, so uh, when you talk about term payment model, um, do you, uh, in Vermont, um, do you envision different payment models depending upon the type of service and provider that, is, that you're dealing with? But that the ACO is dealing with, I should say. The, AC, the ACO is the unit that accepts the alternative payment model. And so when, we, when I'm talking about alternative payment models, and particularly in the context of our all-payer agreement, which uh, looks for there to be an aligned payment model in Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers, mm -hmm. that is the payment model to the ACO. However, the ACO then has the flexibility and the responsibility to make choices about how it pays the providers that are participating in the network. So your alternative payment model is what the state pays to the ACO and private insurance? This, the state, in, in terms of Medicaid, yes, has yes. a contract with okay. the ACO. OK. And then um, does the contract with One Care include parameters around how they institute alternative payment models for the people that contract with them or their members or however you term it? I, I suggest that you follow up on that question with the Department of Vermont Health Access because they have the contract with One Care and can speak to what is it provided for in the contract. I am not sure that that level of specificity is in the contract. I believe that there may be some flexibility for the providers in the network to work together to determine the best reimbursement strategy. Okay. Uh, Tabitha's question and then Carl. Um, oh, and then, sorry, Dan. Do, do, you, um, do you know how they came up with the, uh, the prepayment amount? Yes. In these alternative payment models, the most advanced of which are a prepaid amount, that amount is based on the historical expenditures, health care expenditures, for the population of patients that the ACO has responsibility for. So they look back at what the health care costs were for the group that the ACO is responsible for. They trend those costs forward and then they provide for a per member per month payment. That's an average of all of their members. Historical so costs. An average. Yes. And then in the trending forward, that's where there's an opportunity for cost containment because that trending forward can be at a rate which is more moderate than what otherwise might be uh, the rate in a fee-for-service system where there's no there's no limit on what the expenditures will be at by the end of the year. In the ACO, it's a, in, in the alternative payment model to the ACO, it may be trended forward at 3% growth, but the total dollars are set for the year. <coughs> Carl and I was just gonna say, our designated agency, uh, NCSS, is working to try to figure out how how the social services that they provide integrate into this whole thing you're saying is part of the medical, but there's also the support services that are going to eventually get pulled into this. But I think we're still wrestling with exactly how all that works. It's quite, uh, quite something to be looking at. And, uh, so it be interesting to hear you saying the count, what was the group that we should be hearing from in the future that might have more on this? I think it, I, One Care Vermont is the accountable care organization that's operating in the state today. Yeah. I know. I've, I've been to a couple of their meetings mm -hmm. where, you know, where they laid out the whole thing. I'm just wondering how they bring <coughs> designated agencies and all into 
they have overall knowledge. So we're we'll probably going to hear more about that. Yes, designated agencies are part of One Care's network. You can hear particular the particulars of that from One Care and. The services that designated agencies are providing, some of those services are contained in the contract between Medicaid and One Care Vermont, as well as a, um, the contracts with the commercial participants and the Medicare, because uh, designated agencies do provide mental health and substance abuse services that are considered, they are considered fee for service services as a part of. Um, someone's overall package of benefits. The Medicare model includes in, in its package, uh, and here in Vermont, Medicare Part A and Part B services, which is hospital and physician services. And in the Part B, that's where you see mental health and substance abuse services. Do you think there's a future in anybody who's providing services on a fee-for-service basis? Do you think Medicare is pushing very strongly for its payments to move away from fee for service entirely. Medicare is, um, in the last number of years that I've been working, has only become more aggressive in its goals to move away from fee for service. That being said, I don't think that the whole system would move away from fee for service. And in particular, many Vermont providers accept payment on behalf of persons who are not Vermont residents. If other states are participating in the same way in alternative payment models, those payments to providers will have to remain fee for service. That's one example. I think there are other particular services that may make sense to be delivered in a fee for service Just arrangement. So you think this has something to do with some of our smaller hospitals? No, I don't. No. Other questions before? Not, <laughs> not at this moment. Okay. <laughs> Here's CMS's payment model framework. It's, it shows the first category of payment being fee for service. And it defines fee-for-service as a type of payment that has no link to quality and value. I think that that could be argued, but that's how that's defined here. Category two of the Medicare, Medicare or CMS payment model framework is fee-for-service payment, but with a link to quality and value, meaning there would be at least some portion of payments that would be linked to the quality or efficiency of healthcare uh, delivery. Then there's category three, which are alternative payment models that are built on a fee-for-service architecture, meaning fee-for-service is still the method of reimbursement, but payments are being linked to the effective management of a seg segment of the population or an episode of care. And payments, again, they're still triggered by the delivery of services, but there's an opportunity to share in savings if the system does better because of its uh, work together, its integration, if it does better than a target that's determined in advance. And then finally, population-based payment, which is what CMS defines as category four, and the most advanced alternative payment model is payment that is not directly tr triggered by service delivery, as I explained in the previous slide, and where clinicians and organizations are paid for the response, are paid and responsible for the care of a beneficiary over a long period of time. Where does Vermont's model fall? Vermont's model falls in between category three and category four. Our model falls into category four for Medicare and Medicaid and category three for commercial. <clears throat> So what I don't see on the scale is um, payments made um, in long-term care services that are uh, based on annual budgets, um, billed at a, a monthly or daily rate, but that are all-inclusive in services that um, you know Vermont currently has for some long-term care recipients. And um, I understand the concept of being population-based, but I'm just curious if you have any information about um, 
what long-term care services might look like under a model like this. And I know that they have not been integrated into the ACO mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's an issue that this committee has interest in. I, I think that actually the, the, those services and the way they're paid for now, some of them, some components of home and community-based services for Vermonters are paid in an episodic way. Like a, a, um, so there's a, a bundle of services for a particular need and, the, and that those are paid to the providers or to the families that are, or provided to the families that are contracting for care um, and that they include a number of different services as a part of that bucket of services. So I would say that actually looks a little bit like it in category three. Um, and that is something that is being looked at. Those um, The way that those services are paid for is something that they're looking at, although not necessarily looking at redefining for the purposes of the all care model, but looking at redefining for the purposes of alternative payment models to make it a stronger alternative payment model. So one of the things that's interesting is that the, the payment framework um, it is, seems to really be based upon, um, uh, it's really based on a uh, provider level of, uh, not need, I'm not, <laughs> not the right word, but um, and it, I'm trying to figure out how it uh, enables adjustment for things that uh, are uh, individualized, you know, so where people, where a consumer, an individual who's going to require care for the rest of their mm -hmm. life, that could be 20, 30, 40, 60, 70, 80 years, um, and has an individualized budget that might have a whole array of services, how that fits into any of this. I think you're raising a really important question, and I'm not sure that it does necessarily fit into this. Whether, whether or not that type of payment can be, uh, there can be innovations with that type of payment to make it more complementary with this model because certainly those persons are active and involved with the healthcare system. Um, I think that that's work that we have, mm -hmm. we have for the further work to do in that arena. But it may not be appropriate for certain services to be included in a total cost of care budget, the target for an all payer model. Thank you. It may, at the same time, it may Maybe, be. Maybe, yeah. Yes. I'm not holding you to anything, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a person who has a question. You started out by talking about the health care continuum. Yeah. What is a health care continuum? Um, and because we're talking about efficiency of healthcare delivery, um, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and so delivery of services. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what? So, so what is, or is that coming later? It's not coming later. I think I'll go back to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation slide. It does not delineate the healthcare continuum. I think that. To a degree, the healthcare continuum is defined by those providers and those patients who are a part of it and are utilizing it. Uh, the healthcare continuum is one, though, that I think, according to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others who are thinking about what an integrated healthcare system looks like, it means providers who are um, providing preventive services. Um, as well as providers who are meeting the acute needs of the person, um, whether it's a medical emergency, um, a mental health emergency is a medical emergency. So whether in an emergency situation, whether in a chronic care, uh, in, in terms of complex and chronic care needs, but also looking at uh, more, um, <laughs> we might consider more preventive upstream services. So, so a preventive upstream service is um, the tobacco patch or um, telling mm -hmm. me to actually what is yeah. um, mm -hmm. what, what what are prevention oriented public health. 
I think looking at the members of the Blueprint community health teams could be instructive for thinking about that. Uh, that that's Those the result of Vermont. I'm asking, I mean, is, so is that what you're saying is across the board what, what is a, a continuum of well, care? I mean, no, I think to, it's to improve, defined differently. So it's to improve health outcomes. So what is a health outcome? I guess, yeah. what, what are we looking at as a health outcome? Is it that people live longer, people don't have heart disease? That's a great question. In the video that we just watched from Kaiser, I think that that video is a little narrow in what it's thinking about as a health outcome. It's probably thinking about the, there being a good clinical outcome for a person who needs, uh, uh, who, who needs services for their heart. It's pretty narrow to that definition. Uh, in Vermont, we have our all-payer model agreement. It has three high-level population health outcomes targets, which are to reduce the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease, to reduce deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and to improve access to primary care. So in Vermont, we have a much broader definition of what a good health outcome, we've defined a broader definition, I think, for what a good health outcome would be than other eight accountable care organizations that may be more focused on the uh, very clinical health outcome of a patient. There are many different ACOs, and so one ACO is by no means any other ACOs. As I'll share with you, there are many ACOs operating in the United States in many different forms. There are hospital-based ACOs. There are physician-based ACOs, meaning there's no hospital component of the ACO. It's a group of physicians uh, taking accountability. Um, and there are ACOs that are working exclusively with commercial payers, exclusively with Medicaid, or exclusively with Medicare. Uh, and um, in Vermont, as we'll continue to talk about, the ACO that's operating here is working in a consistent manner with Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers, and is a broad network of providers, not a hospital-only based <coughs> ACO, although there are hospitals, as you're probably aware, quite a few hospitals participating in the, in the ACO. I said uh, that Medicare was moving more more strategically and with more emphasis away from fee-for-service than um, I've seen since I've been looking at alternative payment models, which was about the time that the Affordable Care Act passed. We've seen that Medicare only continues um, to push towards this, towards this goal for paying health care providers differently. And one key component of that is the uh, Medicare Access and Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, which passed in 2015. And this was bipartisan legislation that repealed what was the flawed sustainable growth rate formula for Medicare, meaning Congress had tried to control the rate of growth in Medicare health care costs by applying a growth rate formula year over year that formula was overturned because the healthcare system required more resources. And so while there was a formula in place, it was basically ineffective in controlling growth. And so Congress said in 2015 that they wanted to do away with that and instead look towards a way to uh, increase Medicare rates for providers, but to increase those rates based on their being <coughs> quality and outcomes for patients. So in 2017, based on the bipartisan legislation in 2015, the quality payment program was instituted. And the quality payment program requires healthcare providers that have Medicare patients to either participate in Part B patients, so physicians. It requires those uh, physicians to either participate in a merit-based incentive program, which is called MIPS, or an advanced alternative payment model. An advanced alternative payment model is what I've described to you. And um, MIPS is a very uh, onerous and labor-intensive quality reporting program. In MIPS, providers can either um, 
through their quality score, they can get an increase in their Medicare rate if they perform well, but they can also uh, receive a decrease in their Medicare rate if they don't, don't perform well on quality. Medicare has said that it believes that advanced alternative payment models have uh, more likelihood of providers being able to improve quality and outcomes, and so for those providers participating in the advanced alternative payment model, they are guaranteed a 5% rate increase for Medicare. Other providers could see a rate decrease of up to 9%. They could also see an increase of up to 9%, but, um, and this is in 20, starting in 2020, uh, but that increase um, is based on their successful reporting in the program, which as I mentioned is not easy, and then having uh, very high quality outcomes. Whereas Medicare's, Medicare is trying to push providers into alternative payment models with guaranteeing a 5% increase because they believe that the alternative payment model will uh, achieve better outcomes and has a better framework to help providers <coughs> Towards those outcomes. So Medicare is having a no risk. Try this with no risk. And for the time being. And if I recall, in Vermont, when we started to pass this, we are, it's basically a, um, a no risk for a couple of years. In, in Vermont, in the, so Medicare is saying that if you're a healthcare provider taking Medicare in Part B, that if you're participating in an advanced alternative payment model, which is either in that category three or category four realm, that, that they believe that your quality and outcomes are going to be improved in a way that will guarantee a 5% increase. Um, that's separate from the risk arrangements in these alternative payment models that providers can accept. And we can talk about those as well and how Vermont's programs, alternative payment model programs began and how they've evolved. Because like I said, Vermont's in category four now, um, part of the system is, but we didn't begin there. And I also wanted to emphasize that in 2018, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, so CMS, announced that ACOs that are taking risk in innovative payment models versus those that did not are, are the ones that are generating savings and that uh, that two-sided risk, <coughs> providers have risk, Medicare has risk, that two-sided risk is a model that Medicare wants to move towards and, and to turn away from the no risk for providers. So as I said, there are multiple alternative payment models. With Medicare alone, it has what's called the Shared Savings Program Track 1. This is where Vermont started. This included upside only uh, gains for providers, meaning if there were savings based on the provider's performance, the providers and Medicare could share in those savings. If the providers had not achieved savings and had uh, spent more, then they were not on the hook for that. That's the Medicare Shared Savings Program Track 1, again, where Vermont began. There's also a Track 1 Plus, now Track 2, Track 3, and the ACO investment model, which is a model for non-hospital-based ACOs in rural areas, and the next generation ACO model. The next generation ACO model is the model that Vermont um, is basically in, although because of our all-payer agreement, we have some room to flex, and so the technical name of Vermont's model is the Vermont ACO Initiative. It's grounded in the next generation model, which has the Population-based payment track. And we are sharing it with Dartmouth. I'm looking where the gap mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. That's <clears throat> Dartmouth, um, this is a slide from 2018. Mm -hmm. I believe that Dartmouth was in the next generation model separately from Vermont and is no longer. One Care Vermont has two founding partners, which are the University of Vermont Medical Center and Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. But you're saying Dartmouth isn't in that anymore? It is in, yes, it is a oh, founding is. partner of okay. One Care. Okay. If Dartmouth was separately participating in an ACO program. So with that Vermont showing essentially two dots, there really is one now. <laughs> <laughs> but 
says Vermont and New Hampshire are together. Uh, or Dartmouth and UVM are together, I should say. Vermont should, the, the way I look at this is that there's a dot, the dot should really be in Vermont for Vermont next generation ACO participation. The video raised the question and, and said that the jury was out on whether ACOs spend money. That video is a few years old. Like I said, it was a little dated, but it gives, uh, it, it raises a good question. There have been some mixed results. However, as the ACO program progresses, there are more results and there are more concrete and uh, clear findings that uh, models where there is risk do generate savings particularly the next generation ACO program. As I said, this is the foundation for Vermont's all-payer model. This achieved net savings for Medicare of 63 million re relative to benchmark levels in its first year of 2016. So there are findings that the risk models, the models transferring risk to providers are generating savings. <coughs> uh, and Catherine has a question. That, that, that uh, $63 million saved. Um, does that go, does that stay with the organization? That's, and is it distributed? That 63 million is for the Medicare program. Yeah. So as a healthcare payer, it's looking to reduce its, its costs. It's looking to transfer risk to the healthcare system. It's looking to remain sustainable as a Medicare program uh, and viable. And so it's looking for ways to spend less money so that it continue, can continue to cover its obligations to care for the member, you know, citizens of the United States. And so those 63 million all go back to Medicare as a program. So all go back to the federal government. That's right. And just for you and for the committee, it is 1115. We're on slide six. And which is fine. No, 10. Oh, slide 10. Okay, we're on slide 10. That's two thirds, I think. Yeah, no, no, and, <laughs> and, and at 11.30, because we now have an amendment on the tobacco bill, um, the proposer is coming as well as um, we'll get two people on the phone. Sorry. No problem. Well, that changes quickly here. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to give you some perspective about Medicaid ACOs. There are 12 states that have a Medicaid ACO. Vermont is one of those states. In Vermont, Medicaid has a contract with the ACO. And again, there's a similar contract with Medicare and with commercial payers. So these are the Medicaid ACOs. Now, going back to how Vermont started in um, alternative payment models for ACOs, in 2013, there was an a ACO in Vermont called Accountable Care of the Green Mountains, which was a part of, or was a function of Health First, uh, which is independent physicians in Vermont. And in that year, it participated in the Medicare Shared Savings Program. In 2014, you see that there's a uh, begins what we call an all-payer shared savings program. So the providers that belonged to ACOs participated in the shared savings model with upside only risk for across all payers. And that was uh, in place for two ACOs, Community Health Accountable Care, which was uh, called CHAC, it was, consisted of FQHCs, and One Care Vermont. Those uh, two ACOs participated in all payer shared savings programs from 2014 to 2016. In 2017, Community Health Accountable Care chose not to participate in the Medicaid program because the Medicaid program had shifted from a shared savings model to a uh, population-based payment, the Medicaid Next Generation model, which we have today still. In 2017, Medicaid launched the Next Generation ACO program with the full population-based payment. And in 2018, as prescribed by our agreement with the federal government, One Care Vermont, which was the remaining ACO choosing to participate, uh, it entered into contracts not only with Medicaid, but again with Medicare and commercial for 
uh, two-sided risk in the commercial contract and population-based payments, like I said, for Medicaid and Medicare. So how, what's the universe of the population now being addressed in one care as contrasted to those who are get their services through community health and through um, independent positions? Well, the other ACOs are no longer active. Uh, uh, yeah, I get that. Yes. So I guess my question is, they were, if I get my health care at through the community health center, mm -hmm. I am not part of one care. You are a part of one care. Oh, I'm yes. Okay, now, so, the, so, so everyone now, the, everyone now is part of one care. Well, not everyone is a part of one care, and one care should come in and, t and talk okay. to you about who's in their network. But there are now FQHCs that are part of one care, so FQHCs are part of that network. Well, I said that Medicare is strongly uh, shifting its emphasis to population-based and risk-based payment models that are alternatives to fee-for-service. I think it's important to share that a recent final impact analysis about Vermont's performance in the State Innovation Model Grant, which funded Vermont in its work to develop an all-payer shared savings program, that impact analysis found that Vermont was the only state amongst six states in the cohort to have positive outcomes on utilization of health care services, expenditure measures for health care services, and quality measures. Oh, and so this is the outcome, not just if you like the measures. This is the I outcome. Vermont, performed, Vermont gets a, a plus sign and a green box in all of those categories, different than all of the other states that participated in this program. This was for round one of the state innovation model. Again, there were six states that participated. Vermont was the only state that performed well in all of the categories, and it was the only state that had savings in the ACL model. Vermont generated $97 million of savings in the Medicaid ACL model. No other state had savings. Did they, did they, were they serving comparable populations? Yes. These results here uh, are, the evaluators took into consideration that while Vermont had an all-payer model, and the evaluators considered that that all-payer approach may have advanced Vermont's performance and been a part of our, our good performance, they also chose to evaluate the states on comparable Medicaid models. So meaning that they, the evaluation of savings is for Medicaid only. Uh, the evaluation on expenditure and quality measures is looking at the state's Medicaid participation in their models. However, not all of the states that chose to do payment and delivery system reform chose an ACO model. So you can also see that the three states that did choose ACO models are the three highest performing states in the cohort. States that didn't choose an ACO model relative to the three that did, did not as perform as well. And this is the federal government evaluation of its own program, essentially. The federal government set up uh, the state innovation model program to try to uh, advance the uptake of alternative payment models and to advance cost containment after the Affordable Care Act passed. And the federal government hired an independent evaluator, RTI, to look at how its program uh, worked for, for the states that participated. Just a quick question. Like, I know there are many reasons why Vermont performed so well and achieved savings, but is there kind of one overarching, simplistic kind of reason why they did so well? I don't know that I could I could give okay. one overarching reason. One theme that's really clear in the report from the evaluators is Vermont's iterative approach to reform, meaning that we we innovated in the shared savings program, but we innovated while building on our existing infrastructure, mm -hmm. like patient-centered medical homes, like community health teams. We didn't just start brand new. We chose to incorporate those things and to leverage mm -hmm. our success. 
And another thing, as I said, that could be helping Vermont in its performance was uh, the fact that we were initiating these changes in all three payer groups. Another thing that's interesting about the evaluation is they look at Vermont's stakeholder engagement process and how Vermont worked with the care continuum and the community providers to get to a shared savings model. And while it's not conclusive, uh, I think that there's something to be learned from the evaluation in terms of um, how it looked at Vermont's spending on stakeholder engagement relative to other states. Vermont spent more on stakeholder engagement. What does NS mean on your chart? The gray. I think it means not a, well, uh, I don't know. Um, it's not no data because that's also on the chart. Um, perhaps insufficient, non non specific. Oh. You can all guess what we <laughs> have to guess. I, you know, I no, um, no statistics. I, I, when you, when like you figure it out, can you send a note to Julie, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I fought with myself about whether I should include all of the um, all of the end notes for this chart because the end notes are as large as the chart mm -hmm. itself, and so that's why I left them out, and I apologize. Massachusetts does really well. I just want to reiterate one thing. These six states are the leaders, or they wouldn't have applied to be part of this program in themselves. So everywhere else, nothing like this type of innovation right. is happening. Right. No, nothing. Right. But these guys are the leaders. So even if you're at the bottom, <laughs> you're doing pretty well because <laughs> you're in the group. Yes, round, round one does mean that the first states that were selected were selected because they had shovel-ready projects to test. Carl. It seems to be so. so. Non-significant changes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Connor. <laughs> it seems to be a lot of it also depends upon the involvement and level of engagement of the hospitals in the network, from what I could see it. Recent Northwest, and from what I understand from from Vermont, uh, mm -hmm. this just full disclosure. This has been my husband's entire life for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So we won't ask you to speak yeah. for your husband. Yeah, you can hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know a little bit about it. Oh. The disclosure. My job is to protect. Sure. Mm -hmm. We have two more slides. Okay. To, to sum up where this presentation has, has gone, we've talked about what ACOs are, what alternative payment models are, and I think it would make sense for us to end with talking about our current state, even though I've been talking about it throughout, but to describe it to you exactly what our current state is. The Vermont, uh, Vermont has an agreement with the federal government, with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, for Medicare to participate in an ACO model in Vermont on Vermont's terms. That means that Vermont is able to modify the Medicare ACO model so that it meets the needs of our state, is more appropriate to the needs of our state. It also means, and, and the health of our population, uh, it also means that through the model, Vermont's able to continue to invest in, in the blueprint for health, as well as SASH uh, services and support support and services at home um, with Medicare dollars. If it weren't for the agreement that we have with the federal government, that money couldn't be a part of Medicare's participation in an alternative payment model. It allows there to be additional dollars on the table to support those things. And I think the findings from the SIM evaluation reinforce why it was important to do that, because the SIM evaluation makes clear that Vermont's existing infrastructure has been uh, helpful to leverage as Vermont seeks to take on the risk of alternative payment models. This agreement is intended to test payment changes, like we've been talking about, and those payment changes are ex uh, uh, exclusive to the Accountable Care Organization. It is the entity that accepts the payment change. The agreement is also 
intended to transform care delivery, to invest in care coordination, to incorporate social determinants of health into the healthcare system and to improve quality. And like I said, to improve outcomes for Vermonters, to improve access to primary care for Vermonters, to reduce deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and reduce the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. That's what we agreed to with the federal government. We're also responsible under the agreement for limiting cost growth in the healthcare system and for having a large majority of the healthcare system participate. Again, that's what's called a scale target. I think, again, the SIM findings, um, the final impact analysis that I talked about from the shared savings program is helpful in validating why we have scale targets because the SIM findings suggest that because more of Vermont's healthcare system was involved in the alternative payment model, that that's why it may have had a stronger performance. So involving the majority of the healthcare system and thereby the majority of Vermonters is something the federal government wants to see us do in order to realize the full potential of these payment changes. There's also clear targets for quality measure improvement. Uh, there are 20 of those targets. And there's also an expectation that the payment programs align in key areas, meaning align across commercial payers, Medicare and Medicaid, in order to reduce administrative burden for providers, in order to make it uh, more consistent what the expectations of the program are. That's a quick question. Mm -hmm. Were the savings um, real savings or um, cost avoided? In the Medicaid program, the $97 million was based on the evaluators looking at claims data for a cohort that was attributed to the ACO and for a cohort that was not attributed. And the $97 million are avoided costs. So the group that was not attributed to the Medicaid ACO in the shared savings program had $97 million more dollars of cost than the group that was attributed to the ACO. job description of the person who right now um, uh, reports to you. So we will be looking for your feedback on that as well. That's correct. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, we have um, an amendment from Brian Tina to um, S86. Um, is it um, Logan? Th thank you. Um, Jen is in um, health care. We're asking her to come. But Brian, if you could please um, <coughs> come and uh, talk about your the rationale, the, why you're putting this forward, the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and committee, we will be having on the phone after this um, Rich Pulse. Rich Holshue. Holshue, who's the commissioner from the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, and as well as, um, they can't be, I don't think they can be on the phone at the same time, so a different, um, the director of compliance and enforcement from the department, Vermont Department of Liquor and Lottery. Okay. 
So um, first of all, since Jen's not here, I'll present the language. It's a, se it's a sentence that we're adding to the exemption section in the section of the bill that allows an exemption for an employee of a holder of tobacco license to handle and possess tobacco products, substitutes, and paraphernalia to affect a sale. In that we're adding a person in possession of tobacco products or paraphernalia in connection with participation in a bona fide religious, spiritual, or ceremonial. Oh, I just was doing your uh, um, ceremonial activity. Um, <clears throat> And so I'll explain my rationale. I, I will, would like to point out up front that it says products or paraphernalia and not substitutes because we are talking specifically about traditional uses of tobacco, which mostly involve um, handling tobacco, not even smoking it. And I'll explain in my rationale. Um, so in order to un understand why this exemption is necessary, we have to first acknowledge the history of tobacco and its significance to indigenous people in North and South America. Um, you, to, to, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history, not super detailed. Um, and I don't know if you heard the history of tobacco from anyone else in testimony of this bill. But tobacco is a, a, is a name for a plant uh, that comes from the genus Nicotiana of the Solanaceae, I might be pronouncing that wrong, family, which is the family of nightshade plants. These plants are indigenous to the Americas and have been part of indigenous cultures in the Americas for thousands of years. There's evidence that tobacco was smoked, snuffed, chewed, applied to the skin, possibly taken internally, and used as an offering during prayers. When Europeans invaded North America, they brought tobacco back to Europe, where it quickly became fashionable to use tobacco and uh, without any spiritual, religious, or ceremonial significance. And as colonization spread through the Americas in the 1600s, tobacco became a big cash crop for colonists. Um, this commodification of tobacco um, it contributed to the growth of the practice of slavery because mass production of tobacco is labor intensive. And so by the time of the Civil War, the foundation for the modern tobacco industry had been laid on the soil of indigenous people on the backs of slaves. And as this modern industry is known as you know, big tobacco, is rooted in that history. And big tobacco has indeed caused great harm to the environment as well as great harm on public health, and that, that's without a doubt. However, I think it's important to acknowledge that the problem is big tobacco, the corporate exploitation of a plant, and not little tobacco, the plant. And the, the problem is not the plant, but it's our relationship with that plant, and what are our society's relationship with that plant, and what is the harm that has come from that. So um, despite the exploitation of tobacco for profit, the use of tobacco for sacred purposes never went away, like many other Native American religious, spiritual, and ceremonial practices. Elders have taught children the ancient traditions surrounding tobacco, mostly which involve putting down tobacco as an offering during prayer. Um, I'm going to just read a little piece of an email of a, of a community member from the indigenous community in Brunton, cannot testify, who asked if I would share her words. I don't know if I have to ask permission to do that in committee, but if, if, do I have permission to read a few um, sentences? do, and um, you would ask that be submitted um, as a record. OK. Uh, with her name. OK. Um, so she said, I was not, no, I want to just point out before I read her email that originally the amendment had some additional language in it that said if a person was under 18, they needed to be supervised by someone over 21. And I removed that because of her email. So you're going to hear kind of some of that in this email, just so you know the context. Um, and it's just a set, the middle of her email. It's not the hello, how are you, and the thank you. So, all right. I was not, I also was not aware of this bill, and I appreciate so much your insight and oversight in watching for legislation that may affect our community. As someone who is teaching my grandson, age seven, the importance of smudging and offering tobacco in respect and honoring, I want to be able to have him continue learning and being able to practice the spiritual part of our culture. I like the idea of having someone under 18 being able to do it with supervision, but honestly, it still feels like another colonization type restriction. The younger people are taught to use tobacco in a different way than smoking for pleasure. Tobacco is one of our most important sacred plants. 
to me, it feels like once again laws are being considered that do not take into consideration what it does to an indigenous culture. No tobacco for those who are learning and practicing our spiritual teachings is the same as no speaking your language, no dancing, no heathen praying. That's the end of her quote. So Native American culture has survived constant attacks for thousands of years. As Native American cultural practices were considered illegal, indigenous people continued their ceremonies outside of the law in order to keep their cultures alive. And in 1978, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act returned basic civil liberties and protected and preserved for natives the inherent right of freedom to believe, express, and exercise the traditional religious rights and cultural practices of the indigenous people of the Americas, which include Native Americans, Eskimos, Aleuts, and Native Hawaiians. That's the statutory language. Um, bless you. Um, so these rights, some examples of these rights would be um, would include, but are not limited to, access to sacred sites, freedom to worship through ceremonial and traditional rites, and use and possession of objects that are considered sacred. However, this is federal law that applies to enrolled members of federally recognized tribes and not state recognized tribes. Also, there are many people who are not enrolled in tribes who treat tobacco as sacred, and furthermore, there are many people who don't, won't even accept the colonial practice of having to carry around some kind of card to prove their tribal identity. So um, this brings me back to the question, do we want to criminalize a practice that has crossed cultures for thousands of years because the practice has been exploited? And are we really going to exempt young people from handling tobacco in order to sell it for profit, but we're not going to let them handle it? for their own religious purposes and their own spiritual benefit and to pray and carry out their own traditions. So that being said, I ask for your support of this amendment um, to protect and honor the sacred uses of tobacco in our society. Question, and then at quarter of your, um, someone is expecting us to call, and then um, Jan and they want you to talk about the um, American Indian Religious Freedom Act um, not prepared to be prepared. Okay, um, or whether um, to reference that and specifically to reference the Abnaki, which is the only uh, the only recognized um, tribe in Vermont, whether that would be. But go ahead, ask the question. So I'm just curious. Uh, one thing I hadn't realized when I first heard this, but I think that you're saying is that. So right now, if you're under 18, it must be illegal to handle tobacco in tribes. Is that right? My understanding is that if that it, that it is illegal, the, I think the question is enforcement. Who's calling the police when they see a grandparent give their grandchild tobacco to put down in a prayer, right? Exactly. So that's my problem. But, but it is technically it's, illegal. So it's not really, I'm assuming that it's the enforcement piece is a question today under current law so under this law would be this it, it wouldn't really change the issue that we're already that's already in place in other words people we're not having a problem with this right now and it's even younger younger folks who are um, probably learning to use as that woman said she was under her seven-year-old grandson right so okay that's helpful um, yes. No, I was just going to say there are, of course, many traditional practices that go on in the United States. I, for one, being a Swede, at any celebration, uh, we always had shops. People talk about it uh, starting probably at the age of 12 years of age, which would be illegal. Where's the other right? one? And uh, mm -hmm. we did it because that was our tradition, that didn't, and we've never asked anybody to, to stop that, uh, as I said, to exempt us because of that. So anyway, just a, a point. Many of these traditions okay. go on. Okay, okay. Um, you can answer the question then in the corner of the At that, uh, you know, uh, to that point, uh, mm -hmm. I was talking with a, a Roman Catholic colleague in my committee who I'm not going to name, but just because I don't think it's, it's, you know, we should say what other people say, but I, I asked her, because my recollection growing up going to different ch kinds of churches was that I would see young people going up for communion, and I wondered, you know, do they give them wine? 
in church. And what she told me was, yes, that there is a wide range of practices within the Catholic Church, but that if a person underage went up to get sacramental wine, that they wouldn't be turned away. And furthermore, that I think we were looking at we were looking at the law to see if it actually says somewhere in the law that there is a protection. There's an exception for sacramental use of alcohol. So we have the precedent allowing one religion to sort of honor its tradition, but and allowing priests to give alcohol to minors in the context of a religious ceremony, and so. I feel like that builds the argument, why would we not let families um, provide, it, and we're talking about mostly possession of tobacco, not smoking it, burning it and smudging. Well, smudging, for those who don't know, is when you burn an herb and you pray with it, or putting down tobacco is when you take tobacco and you put it down as an offering to spirits or to the great spirit in prayer. So that's really the main use um, that we're talking about. Okay. Um, we're, go ahead. Representative, um, the way you've worded this, you, you, possession of tobacco products, that, that opens up quite a bit. Yeah, or paraphernalia. And because, paraphernalia opens Because the up. pipe is a sacred, there's, the pipe itself is a sacred item. That smoke, that putting down tobacco is one way in praying, but when you okay. smoke tobacco on a pipe, it represents a union of the male and the female the bowl of the pipe and the stem. And in that union, or the masculine, the feminine, the god and the goddess, and in that union you smoke, and that's a, a way to connect with the spirits. So the, so the reason I left, I used that language is that's the language of the bill, but also it does leave it open, because some cultures do chew, and some cultures do s use snuff. And as, you know, Wait, as, in Vermont? well, people, I think there's a difference between Abenaki tradition and other native traditions. Tobacco was used from the tip of South America all the way as far north as, so there's different variations amongst the indigenous people. Okay, so sure. Yeah, well I think Vermont, as it becomes more multicultural, we're seeing indigenous people move to Vermont from other places. So it's not just about Abenaki tradition, but it's about indigenous traditions, and which is why we left it broader. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Does that mean move? Yes. yes. <laughs> that means move because we are about to um, get on the phone. Sorry. Um, I can just stand up here. The, um, we would appreciate if you would sit. Yeah, I want to sit somewhere out of the way. I can squeeze in here with a lot of this. So where's the office? He's right up there. Okay, please. I think we need to hold. I just read something at the coloring group. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, please unplug anything that's on the. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm here. Good. Uh, can you, and you can hear us. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? You're, you're breaking up. Okay. <laughs> um, we're working on it. We're, we're working on it, and I'm trying to. Can you hear me now? I can hear you a little bit better, yes. Okay. Um, yes. We keep trying. Um, we sent you a copy of a proposed um, amendment, which we, which would be to, um, I need it um, up, sorry. I believe we sent it to you, which would be to um, exempt from the possession um, of tobacco, um, a person in connection with participation in a bona fide religious, spiritual, or ceremonial activity. Um, and um, we would appreci appreciate if you would identify yourself um, for people around the room and to comment. We might have a question or two. Certainly. Uh, my name is Rich Holshu. I am a resident of uh, Wampasigak, which we know as Brattleboro, Vermont today. 
I serve on the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, and I work with the Abenaki community, um, contemporary community in the state, um, in their interests, um, particularly with uh, items such as this, mm -hmm. uh, where there's an interface with a, a regulatory body or an agency. And so uh, I have received and read over the proposed amendment, um, which brought to my attention by Representative Tina. And um, I am fully in agreement that there should be um, awareness of uh, religious practices uh, with respect to this. Um, it's, a, it's a minor amendment. Uh, it would be with regard to possession um, only for uh, for those purposes, as you stated, bona fide religious, spiritual, or ceremonial activities. Uh, I don't see any need to, um, to to step in and ask to amend the proposed change on sale of products. Uh, I understand that point of sale regulations need to be um, uh, easily understood and enforceable. So um, requiring a separate uh, a system of identification at that point could be cumbersome. But the possession uh, part is, uh, is much too, too broad, and it uh, flies in the face of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978, which does recognize that there are practices so, such as this. Um, the recognized, um, does the from your perspective, does um, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act protect um, Abenakis? That is a federal act, mm -hmm. and as with all federal acts, it applies to federal interpretation of who is a, uh, a native person in their eyes, and that is federally defined as a recognized tribe. So the spirit of the law does, mm -hmm. but the letter of the law does not. And um, are the Abenaki uh, in Vermont a state recognized tribe? They, there are four rec state recognized bands of Abenaki people in the state of Vermont. Okay. Um, and can you very briefly um, describe for us what would be a, um, in any of those tribes, what would be a bona fide religious, spiritual, or ceremonial activity in, um, related to tobacco or tobacco paraphernalia? Sure. Um, and this is in my words, so I'm not, I'm not positing myself as the, uh, the be all and end all. But the use of tobacco uh, in, in these practices typically um, consists uh, not of smoking the tobacco itself, although it may, but typically does not. Uh, this is simply a, a, a possession of and placing of tobacco as an offering or recognition in spiritual practices. So there actually is absolutely no health risk involved. This is merely holding it and putting it down somewhere. So we're talking about a leaf or a stem? Yes. yes. Um, this is gener generally speaking about tobacco in its raw form. It could be in a leaf. It could be uh, uh, ground, but it's not, uh, it's not a tobacco substitute. It's not a processed product. Per se, a manufactured product, I should say. Okay. But it could be roll your own. Sure, that's raw tobacco. Um, but again, I'm talking about possession, not sales. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and generally speaking, these practices would be under adult supervision. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think that that is necessary uh, to be included in the law. Mm -hmm. uh, there are children that do follow these practices as they are taught by their elders. Mm -hmm. And um, are where do these bona fide religious, spiritual, or ceremonial activities take place? They can take place anywhere. Um, 
the world is our relative. And so when we are interacting with aspects of the world, um, it could happen anywhere. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Hi, uh, Carl Rosenquist here from Stanford. Uh, could uh, non-Native Americans uh, enter into these ceremonies or essentially ascribe themselves to this, uh, these practices, or is that prohibited? I, I would see, um, hello Carl, uh, that's a good question. Um, I understand there's a bit of a difficulty in interpretation here. I, I would see the, the proscription of, of non, uh, non-native people or non-recognized people, however, wherever you want to draw those lines. I would see that proscription as another infringement on religious freedom. Um, I don't think it can be restricted to a particular group by uh, by ethnicity because that's discriminatory. And so, whereas the effect is probably going to be uh, most greatly felt by, uh, in, in my opinion, Native American uh, people, um, I don't think it should be restricted to that. I, I think you're starting to, uh, to go down a, a, a road that going to raise more problems than it will solve. Absolutely. Follow um, yeah. A follow-up then, so uh, to that, let's just assume then that a non-Native American decided to use this as cover to mm -hmm. possess uh, tobacco products so that uh, they would not be fined. Uh, I can't see how that would be protected in this uh, amendment. Well, so the, intent, it, the overall it, intent of this law would be protection. <clears throat> protection of traditional religious practices, and it's not for me to say who's, who's doing those practices. However, if, if prosecution, if, if it was decided that somebody wanted to, to uh, question whether someone was actually participating in a bona fide religious, spiritual, or ceremonial activity, I would think that the answer to that could be gotten to very quickly. Um, especially if there was a, a, a component of adult supervision. Again, I, I recognize the inherent difficulty in defining this. But I don't think we can throw the baby out with the bathwater to use the trite phrase. Uh, it, 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 it's just patently silly to say you can't possess tobacco. You're not smoking it. You're putting it down as an offering. Um, Mary Beth and then Todd. Well, this is Mary Beth Redmond from Essex. Um, just a quick question. I'm curious, how, how regular is this practice? Is it something that happens, you know, once a month, um, every now and then, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of like, um, at any rate, that's the question basically. Like, how ongoing is this for a, a, a young, you know, a young person? How often would they participate in this kind of worship? Um, I, I would say that there's no periodicity to that because that's a, that's a following a calendar such as, you know, the Sabbath is on the seventh day or the first day, or wherever you want to place it, according to your faith. It's a, it's a practice where there's interaction with, um, the, with the world around you. And so it, it could be, you know, it could be once a year, it could be once a week. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if Representative Tina mentioned this, but I was with uh, Chief Roger Longto of the El Abenaki tribe on Friday at Bellows Falls, and we were we were meeting some students from Dartmouth who were participating in a project for their anthropology class. And we were at the falls, and when we're at the falls, which is a sacred location, um, it is incumbent upon us, it's our responsibility to recognize where we are and to leave uh, and to leave a recognition of that often in the form of tobacco. And so we did that, the two adults that were there the two young ladies, the three young ladies that were with us, um, who 
I, I don't know their age for sure, but they may have been underage according to, to this act, uh, this proposed act. Um, I offered them tobacco for them to leave an offering, which they accepted and which they followed through with. Now, under this law, I would have been in violation. But what they did was the appropriate thing for that place and was of the moment. It was not planned. But that, that kind of speaks Thank to you. Thank here's you. an opportunity. Thank you. Yes. Tom, do you have a question? Then we have someone else who would like to weigh in. Tobacco, okay. tobacco paraphernalia. What, why do you need that? Um, sometimes there is a pipe ceremony which may involve smoking. I, I would say that that is um, the exception. And it is um, always under supervision because you're going to be doing this with your health, with one's elders. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. OK. Thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you. Thank you for um, being available at the last minute. Appreciate your um, input into this. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye -bye. Um, and now we have um, on the phone shortly um, the Director of Compliance and Enforcement from the Vermont Department of Liquor and Lottery. Can we hold? <laughs> From what? It exempts from the uh, restriction on possession, 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 <coughs> underage possession. So, uh, and it adds, so you've got that, the, um, from underage possession, um, a person in possession of tobacco products, paraphernalia, et cetera, in, um, with participation in a bona fide religious, spiritual, or ceremonial activity. And That's uh, um, some of our questions relate to. Um, Prior to this proposed law, it was a person under 18, and so we're wondering what your enforcement plan is has has been for people under 18, and um, et cetera. And if we were to change it, what your that's so right. So contextually, uh, in my six year experience with the department. Uh, we have never dealt with an issue of spiritual or religious use of tobacco products by anyone under the age of 18. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, departmental position on that. It is just simply an, an issue that hasn't been brought to the department's attention. I do not believe that the department takes a position where we would oppose this amendment. Um, 
Uh, we, so we, we, essentially, we just have, have very little experience or have very little inquiry about the application of federal law in regards to, uh, again, that spiritual, religious, or tribal use of tobacco products. Tapper. We understand that this can take place at any time, any place. Um, how could you monitor these activities to make sure? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I, yes, sir. Uh, I think that it would be it would pose some difficulty. I don't know as I could put a, a liquor investigator or any law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont, in particular, in a position of judging what is a yeah, what is a again a tribal, religious, spiritual use of a tobacco product. Uh, it, it is, it, it, I do anticipate some challenges there defining what that is and what that looks like. Um, I, I can't provide much more in the way of a, a response there. I could certainly see some challenges. Um, again, I, I just we don't have a lot of context because we've met, not dealt with the issue historically. Okay. Uh, uh, this is uh, Representative Teresa Wood. So any challenges that you might uh, predict as a result of um, this actually already exist today? Is that right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I, didn't quite, I didn't quite hear that. So um, any challenges that, that um, you might have in determining um, a religious or ceremonial activity, uh, you know, essentially we have those practices happening now um, and, and theoretically for people under the age of 18. So it has not been a large problem for you is, is I guess, my question. That, that is absolutely correct. Um, I just, I, again, I struggle with the scenario in which law enforcement will encounter that, per se. In my 13 years of law enforcement, I certainly haven't encountered any use in possession during some sort of bona fide, uh, or, or any sort of, again, spiritual, religious, or tribal purpose. I'm not certainly saying that that doesn't exist. I'm certain, it, 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 I'm confident that it, it likely does. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that, um, there's been little, little to no cause for law enforcement involvement in regards to that. We've got no complaints. We've certainly not interdicted its use in that context. Um, Thank you. So, yes. Um, this is a new amendment to us. Thank you very much. Is there other questions for the Department of um, Liquor and Lottery and the Tobacco Control people? Go ahead, Carl. Just Somewhat along the lines of what I asked before, Carl Rosenberg from Georgia, Vermont. But uh, it just seems to me that this opens the door for a, uh, a person 18 years of age, let's say, who currently supplies vaping products or, well, okay, I take that back, actual tobacco products to, to youngsters that are younger than 18. And at, at this point, the law would, I mean, the law we're proposing, would prevent them at 18 years old to possess this this substance and distribute to people younger. And by virtue of this exception, and the gentleman we talked to, the Native American we talked to previously, said he couldn't see that we, the religious practice could be prohibited for people that are not Native American. So it would seem that somebody could use this as a reason they possess this product uh, and to be exempted from punishment and fine. I certainly would, uh, I see your viewpoint and would agree with you, Representative Rosenquist. Again, I do see a, a huge challenge in the fact that in the amendment, uh, I, I certainly don't see any definition of uh, a religious, spiritual, tribal purpose that would leave a law enforcement officer in the position of determining what is and what is not, and uh, that would be a very uncomfortable position to say the least. So in that regard, I, I certainly agree and accept your viewpoint and would concur. Thank you. Other questions for Skyler? Skyler, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Yeah, you're very welcome, Representative Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from Tobacco 21 who wants to comment on this amendment or whether um, I'm offering or whether the health department wishes to um, 
comment on this amendment at this point in time. Health Department is not. I'll be very brief. Jennifer Hasta, um, Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Um, I will be speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Tobacco Free Vermont, which is Cancer, Heart, Lung, and Vermont Medical Society. Um, while we sincerely appreciate the spirit of this amendment, um, we are opposing it because we feel that enforcement would be incredibly difficult and it might unfortunately just be a loophole for exploitation. <coughs> I don't want to stand between him and lunch. <coughs> Not Jennifer, of, of the other Jen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jen, um, can you remind me what the definition of tobacco products is? I know there's a specific definition. include, um, I was having a trouble remembering the, the sort of broad definition that included the other stuff like uh, jewels and things like that. That's not tobacco substitutes. Substitutes, so that is not okay. included in the amount. Okay, all right, thank you, that's and, all I wanted. And so is a, is a tobacco leaf um, a tobacco <coughs> product? Um, I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. It also says tobacco. Well, there's and, and other tobacco products. So I don't know what new smokeless so tobacco, tobacco is. Yeah. Um, and we can look at the definition in the tax law of other tobacco products, from, derived from, or containing tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, chewing, or in any other manner that does not include all of the things that are included in the definition of tobacco products. And so up above, I, uh, maybe we may see what new smokeless tobacco is. I'm not sure that gets it done. No. Oh, it does. Any tobacco product manufactured from, derived from, or containing tobacco that is not intended to be smoked as a particular moisture content or is offered in individual single dose tablets or other discrete single use units. So tobacco that is not a product containing tobacco that is not intended to be smoked, you could argue is could could include um, raw tobacco, but you could also be more specific about unprocessed. I guess it seems like from what the um, I can't remember the man's name. Oh, please speak up. Um, it seems like from what we heard on the um, phone that they're really talking about a leaf or a stem in its most raw form is is not included in this bill. I think you could you can get there, but I think you could be more explicit about it. I mean, I think you can potentially get there through the definition of new smokeless tobacco, but you may want to be more prescriptive than that if, if your purpose is really for 
I think you heard it was the leaf stem or the ground ground form, right. um, but it sounded like the unprocessed nature of it was, and and you know without nicotine, things like that, more that distinguished it. That it was smoked. But there was also it is smoked in some ceremonies. In some ceremonies. Right. We're talking about under 21. I guess for me, this is a bigger discussion to not have in this short period of time. I worry about enforcement and opening the door to a whole new uh, way of looking at smoking or not, or rituals. What I'm wondering is that um, it makes sense for us to um, do what this community loves to do or has historically done, which is to send a letter <coughs> directing um, a group of people to um, look at an issue and come back with more clear mm. um, direction. And so that would be the health department um, and um, uh, the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs. The amendment as it is proposed um, does not limit it to um, Native American, and so whether or not there are other uh, spiritual, whether other, but to actually ask, ask these um, people to have a full and robust discussion about and um, try to, in fact, um, both support what is um, clearly part of what we've heard testimony, what we heard on the phone, um, part of the Native American um, ceremonies. Um, and we've heard from the proposal of the amendment, amendment they does not want to narrow it to that, but to more broadly spiritual and others. Um, it just seems, I, I, picking up on what you said, um, it sometimes good legislation Sometimes bad legislation gets put out when we haven't had the opportunity to, to really define and look at things. Um, but a good point to be heard from the um, Tobacco 21 people that they appreciate the um, the concern. Mm -hmm. um, but that they're concerned about loopholes, well, how do we balance that? And that mm -hmm. seems to be part of a longer discussion. And the paraphernalia piece is part of a longer discussion, too. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the definition of paraphernalia, it talks about bombs and mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know where other people are. I'm not, I'm not for the amendment. Well, I would entertain a, um, a, a motion so that we have a position. I'll do it. And I'll your motion? I'll make a motion to approve this amendment. Okay. There's a motion to approve the amendment on the straw um, as a further discussion. I mean, two of us, three of us, four of us have said, made some comments. What, what are other comments? Anyone want to have So I, I, I feel very mixed mm -hmm. about this. Um, because, um, you know, it, 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 we have a stipulation in Vermont statute for sacramental wine, mm -hmm. you know, a stipulation there. But I do agree that we need more information. Like, I don't feel like we've had the proper time to really vet this and look at this. I feel like the language in that um, is very expansive. I feel like it needs to be narrowed so that we don't create a loophole. But I really do feel uh, that it's important that we you know, we honor the, the, the rituals and ceremonies that are not familiar to us, and we allow space for that. So, you know, I'm, I feel very mixed about it. Top so, so, so my recommendation along the lines of what the chair is saying is let's send, let, let's get the thing done right. Mm -hmm. The way it is now, I can't vote for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, there's too many unintended consequences. I respect the the religious piece of it. Um, if it was that, that, if it was worded just that way, um, and very narrow to it, 
been a problem. But it's, it's too expensive yeah. at this point. Yeah. Right, because one of the things about the spiritual wine, it's always pre always in a church setting. And so maybe there's a way to look at setting as well as there's just so much that um, that maybe the commission is it a commission? Or? Well, I, I mean I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I mean we would ask you to come back tomorrow or with a letter that we could. I mean, and, and, sorry, we haven't. If that is where people went, because and I'm picking up from what you said and others, which is how do we both honor and at the same time not undo what we're trying to do. And I would push back on the church thing, because for Native Americans, the whole world, the world is, is church. their church. church. Yeah, so. Right, right. right. So, 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 so can I just ask, the letter you're talking about would be just advisory in nature? To the, the, letter, the, letter, no, the, the letter would be to the commissioner of health, um, probably to pull together. Um, but would be outside of the, the the bill that we are passing. Mm -hmm. And ask them to come back by to pass. Okay. Yes. And ask them ask to come back by January, um, whenever, 4th, 5th, whenever the first day is, with a recommendation on how to marry um, the importance of honoring um, spiritual, religious practices for honoring the, and as well as um, keeping tobacco out of the hands of. I, I participated personally in several sweat lodge get togethers with different groups of people, and usually it's uh, to burn the tobacco leaf and just make the odor of the tobacco mm -hmm. in, the, in the lodge. Mm -hmm. okay. And then they may pass around a pipe as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way mm -hmm. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out that it's, it is currently illegal under, it is illegal under current law at 18, below mm -hmm. 18. Mm -hmm. So we're not just talking about the effect of this, of the bill that's before us, but we're talking about a change to existing law. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, because there's no, there's no So, I, I, so I think that we do small homework on it. Yeah. yeah. Get it right. Yeah. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on the um, motion that's on the table <coughs> to um, um, accept uh, the amendment by Brian, by Representative Jean? Sure. So. Okay, all those, um, the amendment, the, the your 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 motion was to support. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, show of hands, all those who um, support uh, Representative Chima's amendment. The I don't know how I say this. Why am I like that? Lots getting confusing there. I know. You support you. Much. All those who support your your um, proposal. Okay. Um, to support, nine opposed. Um, so the position of the committee is not to support the amendment. Um, all those who support, um, I would entertain a motion to um, direct legislative council to write a um, letter um, uh, requesting, because I guess we can't demand. Right, you know, um, they will. Um, the Department of Health, uh, the Commission on Native American Affairs, uh, Director of Compliance and Enforcement, and Tobacco 21. So I, I move to amend, I mean, not to amend, sorry, to send a memo to the Vermont Department of Health to look into how we honor the On a five religious ceremonial activity. Further investigate. Yeah, further yeah. investigate. Yeah. Right. Right. All those in favor? Yeah. 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 Motion put forth by Jessica. Oh, that's what it is. Motion put forth. Sorry. 
I couldn't remember that before. Motion put forth by Jessica. All those in favor? Okay. Can I can I change my vote? Um, I'm going to join the others. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Join the others. What? Uh, in um, approving and supporting the amendment. So it is now on the eight three. Yep. Three. Three, three opposed. Three, three in favor. Three in favor. Eight, eight opposed. I believe that the, the speaker specifically asked that the. When we report it, that it report that we report that the committee um, does not approve. Yes. That's, no matter how the motion That's is right. made, That's the right. speaker in attempting to have us all know what we're voting on. Okay, thank you.